I'm inside, Joe. Uh, it's, uh, it's my honor this morning to moderate um, our gathering here, but before we start, my, my name is Adit Mulyanen, and uh, I am a native, uh, <laughs> native of uh, Nigeria, but um, home is where you pay your taxes, so I, I pay my taxes here. <clears throat> Anyway, before we start, we're going to have a short prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and faithful Father, we've come before you at this time, this morning, on this day, to commit our deliberations unto your charge. In particular, we go to your presence, to worry, with this ambition to lead the nation. Our nation, Nigeria, we ask you, Lord, to touch his heart, speak for him, and speak through him. Speak for us and speak through us, O Lord. Let us see the vision that he will light Nigeria to regain his glory. Father God, we commend his determination and his aspiration. Just as to have assigned David to lead the nation of Israel. So, so you use those who are least counted worthy to lead nations. Gideon, Samson. The names are many. We're asking you Lord to support, guide, provide the necessary resources for Moya to be able to see the vision. Anointing, we ask you, Lord, on him, and those who have given him the advice, touch their hearts, speak for them also, and speak to them. Speak for the people of Nigeria who have not heard about him, and who will hear about him. That your name, your glory, will be reflected. And that nation that has been a shining example for the world to see, will regain his path and his vision. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so much. Well, before we start, uh, number one, um, it's good to know who is in the room. So we will have a brief introduction of each person. And uh, madam, we will start with you. Uh, Ladies first. Ladies. <laughs> I wanted to at least maybe systematically go around the room. <clears throat> um, so please name where you pay your taxes. And, uh, <laughs> we'll go forward. Okay, my name is Larry Mafortel. I pay my taxes in Canada. Thank you. <laughs> Which problem? Alberta. Alberta, yeah. welcome. Thank you. My name is Nuruddin Balogun. I pay my taxes in Chicago. Excellent. Thank you. My name is Faye Yadoja. I pay my taxes in Chicago. Oh. <laughs> oh, will you pay enough in Oakland? <laughs> Hi, my name is Shade Adoja, and I pay my taxes here in Chicago. Yes, I'm Baba Jide Ola Uraimo. I reside in Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this guy is now full. Sorry. Hi, my name is Toby. Toby what? Twice. I pay twice. <laughs> 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 we are on, we are 
We are all guys. We are all. Everybody who. Who were women? And I believe this is where I am obligated to pay tax. Ghanaian dada, you know, in Chicago. Excellent. We we just. Oh, we shagged the Williams in Street, Illinois. And what do I pay my taxes? Oh, it depends. <laughs> oh, it depends. Ah, sorry, like I think you skipped someone. She got in Delhi, Chicago. Excellent. Elijah Island, Chicago. Excellent. Uh, Kolaide. I uh, still pay my taxes for now in Chicago. For now. Hopefully, <laughs> when they become president, I'll be paying the next year. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, you know that. You get to be introduced. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. so, so, moving along. Well, thank you all for, for, for giving us that uh, <laughs> personal information. We didn't ask for the social security, but that's next time. <laughs> um, <laughs> So now I'd like to yield to Mr. Obajide Ola Brahma to give an introduction of yes. our guest of honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's an opportunity for me to uh, take this uh, position to introduce the guests in our midst. But before I proceed, I would like us to look at um, uh, number two in the agenda. If you look at that name, uh, that why. Second to the last word is L, it's not Y. Oh, okay. 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 So, um, and the last name, too. So, so, right. so yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the E is O. Oh, yes. yes. So, um, it's supposed to be that uh, it is important to have his presence in Chicago and also in our midst, even though uh, he's planning to uh, go for another. Um, gathering which will be later in the evening. But prior this morning, we want him here and then to tell us his uh, goals and uh, his ambition and then uh, everything that it entails that he wants to carry along, carry Nigeria along into uh, the next year called uh, February 2019. However, I would like you to know that uh, he's an activist way back in his secondary, I mean, high school and college days. He's always fighting for justice. He's always on the rights of, of the uh, less privileged. And uh, he has done that through uh, some other politicians. And uh, he has also worked against some government in position like uh, people like uh, uh, Babangida, uh, the wrong IMF, he fought against it. And then after graduating, then he started his own Sarah Reporter. I mean, social media in New York, he's been doing that for the past 13 years. He also used that media as well to also work against, I mean, all the cabals in our, in government in Nigeria that has been disabling Nigeria for so many years, 50 years, so to speak. But I can guarantee you all that he has the temerity to face anyone in power. He also has the dexterity, which means the knowledge to challenge anybody. So I would like to say that uh, we should give him a chance, give him support, especially financially support. That's the reason why he's here in Chicago. And I would like to introduce him, Mr. Omoyele Shogore. And the first February 2019, you become the president. Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So. We've had an introduction, yes. and now we want to hear from you. <laughs> if you will give us the honor, we will appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you don't guys get so Welcome much. to Chicago. Thank you. I, I, let me just stand up briefly. Um, I'm uh, very delighted and happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation, sir. I got the invitation a little bit uh, last minute that I had to address uh, businessmen, Nigerian businessmen in Chicago so that we can start having this progressive conversation about how to take Nigeria back completely with the help of people who are also knowledgeable about how societies work in other places. But I remember that uh, Chicago has some key uh, decisions in the history of Nigeria, contemporary history, uh, that really helped Nigeria to attain democracy. 
and also helped the U.S. to have some fundamental change in uh, race relations. And I will give you also a little bit of background of myself. When I first came to the U.S., Chicago was the first place I came to to get a driver's license 19 years ago uh, before I then relocated to uh, the New York area. And uh, But most importantly, you must remember, for those of you who have been around, that there's a woman named Carol Brown. 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 Uh, Brown. Uh, then I was a student activist in Nigeria, and this woman came to Nigeria, collected money from a bacha, and uh, was promoting a bacha to become the civilian president of Nigeria. She took so much money that she became arrogant when she came back to Chicago, thinking that nobody can defeat the money she brought back. And I was told that a very vibrant community here of Nigeria stood up to her and she lost the election. It's the first time Nigerians made someone lose an election in the US and it happened right here in Chicago. But beyond that, when I talk about race, it's about Obama's election. Nigeria is also in, the, in this area and of, of course everywhere else contributed massively to Obama's election. I, before I even thought about Obama's ability to win, contributed $250 that I didn't have towards his election. And we have been saying to ourselves, if you love other parts of the world so well, why not replicate the same thing at home? That is why we have focused a lot on the diaspora in our, <coughs> in our campaigns. Uh, the reason is uh, a little bit uh, simple, but it's a function of research. We found out that Nigerians in the diaspora, second to you know, our oil revenue, contribute the most to Nigeria's GDP, about $50 billion every year. In fact, before, as of the last quarter, which is, uh, I think the last quarter ended in September or so, yeah. Nigerians have already sent home about $60 billion. Wow. Yeah, so in the last three quarters, this is the time we send the most money. The, you know, and, you know, apart from the Christmas, we actually take money home in our luggages, you know, we buy gifts. So by the end of this year, we probably have contributed over $80 billion. So it's approaching $100 billion. But when you hear about all of these countries that are giving aid to Nigeria, the U.S. over three years was only able to give Nigeria $713 million in aid. It's not aid, it's not cash. Is aid as and you know things that they claim they give to us. Mm -hmm. So if you think of it, do we really need foreign aid when we have foreign brothers and sisters, sons and daughters? No, but we need to energize and mobilize our people, not only to contribute to this endeavor, which is important, but also to start thinking creatively on, on you know about how to go back home and fix Nigeria, because most of you are the ones fixing the other parts of the world. You're using your sweat your skill sets, your knowledge, you're using everything you have, your Nigerianness, uh, which cannot be defined psychologically, <laughs> you know, economically, or mentally, but there's something about being a Nigerian that is, you know, very, very unique. Uh, so this is the reason why I decided to come here today to not only change ideas with you, to tell you, you know, comprehensively how we intend to discuss Nigeria, so we must start having thematic conversations. When I mean thematic, you know, everybody has been speaking broadly about what they want to do for Nigeria in this election, even though we have one of the most comprehensive uh, agenda, which is in 10 places for Nigeria. There's nobody who is running for election in Nigeria who is speaking of Britain life through data, through engagement, through interaction with Nigerians. And the truth is that a lot of Nigerians are also not looking at data so much because hunger has destroyed whatever is left of their strength and their ability to process or engage with data. But our brothers in diaspora, sisters in diaspora care about these things a lot. They want to hear the nitty gritty of what, you know, if you say you have a housing policy for Nigeria, this is a place to discuss how many units of housing do you need? We looked at it, 17 million units of housing is needed to address Nigeria's housing deficit. And when you look at how much that is, you might be scared. But the truth is that we can provide them 
because they can pay for themselves. When you house people, they actually pay, you know, either mortgage or rent. But there are no structures in place. There are no policy formats or, you know, uh, institutions in place that are capable of addressing this deficit. When you talk about road infrastructure, right? How many kilometers or miles of highway do you need? And what we have chosen to do at our party, which is the African Action Congress, is to start addressing comprehensively how many kilometers of highways we have in the first place. We looked and found out that we have over 200,000 kilometers. But there is no way in Nigeria where you can find 30 kilometers of highway that is motorable. And I'm not exaggerating. Yes. yes. Probably the best you can find is between Bini, you know, and Lagos. There's no unbroken 30 kilometers of highway that you can without hitting a bump, a crater, or a pothole, or even a lake in the middle of the highway. Uh, our brother here is from Badagri. We went to Badagri. We couldn't make it to Badagri in five hours. I was supposed to return from Badagri to go to um, uh, to come back to the to, to, I was going on a foreign trip. I had to drop out of the car that we're driving on our way back to Badagri and hop on a motorbike to get to the airport. That was how bad it was, and you know how dangerous it is to navigate our highways. So we said when we went to Badagri that it is time for Badagri to completely secede from Nigeria <laughs> no, it's true because Nigeria has cut off Badagri. Guess what? A few weeks later, the government awarded the contract to fix the road, but they are not going to do it. We know it is all propaganda. It's meant to bribe the psyche of voters in those areas. Uh, but, you know, we want to create 200,000 additional kilometers of highway, and it's to do or recreate what it did in the U.S., which is the interstate highway system. We want to do an inter-regional inter highway system where every region of Nigeria Southwest to the south east, from there to the south south, from there to the north central. I had, these places are connected by dual carriageway everywhere. But beyond that, it's not just about highway alone. We want the train system that is functioning. Ladies and gentlemen, Morocco of all places just launched the fastest train yesterday. I mean, I think three days ago, they invited the president of France to come and launch the fastest highway I and mean, railway system on the continent of Africa. It's going to be about, I think, 317 kilometers per hour, which means that if, they, if you are going from Lagos to Abuja, you can do it in two hours. Right now, it takes 12 hours. That is if you pray before you left <laughs> and make it down there in one piece. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't, this, I have seen, I've driven around Nigeria in the course of this campaign. When you're talking about education, we want to break it down to how many kids are out of school. Found out officially 13 million kids. But how do you return them back to school without allocating resources to them? And what we said is, look, we can allocate right away as a matter of emergency, 100,000 naira to every kid that is out of school to bring them back to school. That was $100,000 in that one year. It pays their teacher. It pays for their space in school. It's the same way it is done here. When they want to fix problems, they look at individuals who are affected. They invest individually. And the collective investment by individual will make those things happen. Uh, they make them possible. And, you know, I, I, I did my master's here in New York, and one of the uh, studies we did on how they reformed the New York police. The New York police used to be as bad as the Nigerian police. Corrupt, broken system. And I think it was Office, Officer uh, Brad, you know, Bradford or something. Yeah. Bradford. Uh, Bratton, who came and he sat a police officer in front of him and said, What do you need to make you do your job without distraction? They started from the belt, you know, a holster, the gun, shoes, two pairs of shoes, two pairs of uniform. How much will it, you know, cost you to cut your hair properly, you know, so that you look decent? It cost two thousand dollars, so they allocated two thousand dollars to each policeman. By the time they made the investment, sent them back to work, then they made their bosses to be responsible. You say every week you have to come and tell us the statistics of crime in your area. Anybody who is having problem with crime, 
We have to leave. It will be clear to you when others are presenting. So now there's competition. And when they started what they call Comstat, you know, which is the computer statistics of crime in the city of New York, then they were able to situate crime within policing. Within such a short time, they moved on from the officers to say, how many officers will fit into a car to make it possible for them to carry out an arrest? Two officers. The back of the car then became the temporary detention of a suspect. And that was how New York City, the NYPD, became a police force to be reckoned with. It took the ingenuity of one man to fix it. And consistently, that became an institution that, even without a person with a name now, the NYPD became an institution that can fight crime effectively. It's still, they are unable to fight crime as well as they should. I'm just giving such as an example of the same things that we need to do in Nigeria. Not necessarily to recreate that, but to use our own objective conditions right there to fix a lot of problems. We have the money to do this. Somebody will tell you that, look, oh, there's not enough Nigeria. We, have, we don't have resources to do this. We do. Because when you talk about resources, it's not only about your budget. You are talking about the resources that are available if you open up your system so that people can come in with it. Think about people in the diaspora, for example. You want to go home and do business. So many of you even want to relocate home. Some of you want to go and build houses. You want to do wonderful things at home, but you can't even think about it when you travel home once and at the airport, you can't even make it out of the airport as normal people would do. When you come back, you swear that you are not going back to Nigeria again. But imagine that the society there is open enough. What will happen is that we will double our revenue back home because now you are frequenting home. Each time you go to Nigeria, you don't spend less than $2,000 before you come back. So imagine that you are now doing 10000 because you can go and come back. You can go and be safe. You can go and invest. You can go and get a mortgage to build a house. You can go and even volunteer your time as a doctor, as a teacher, as an architect. You can go and do a social experiment that you want to build, you know, a million houses. And you can find officials of the state who are receptive to the idea, not the ones that will steal your idea and point a gun at you. If you don't leave my office, I'll kill you. You know, those kind of things. So this opens up the Nigerian space. And if you look at the raw materials available, you look at the labor, that is cheap enough for you to carry out what it will cost you $50,000 to do in Chicago to build a nice house. It will cost you $10,000 and you will still make the same. You build a fantastic home because labor is cheap, raw materials are there, you don't have to go and break because of bad weather. It's almost year round you can build in Nigeria. So, but it takes a certain level of leadership to carry out these things and you take leaders that are capable, leaders that are exposed, leaders that have intellectual capacity, leaders that have international experience, leaders that have seen things work in other places, leaders that are human resource oriented. What is human resource orientation as far as I'm concerned is that you can actually, as president of Nigeria, hire capable hands, not your in-laws or your brother or sisters or your imam or pastors people who can get things done and Nigeria will start working again. So these are some of the things that we have been talking about. These are the things we have been exposed to and the same thing applies to agriculture. Same applies to healthcare. Healthcare in particular has some relevance to those of us who they never just take like this. <laughs> 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 I was, I was scared. I said, these guys followed us here. <laughs> so, so, you know, but the one that, those, the most important ones that would propel and be a key driver to all these issues we are discussing are these two uh, below. Power, that is electricity and security. Yeah. When it comes to developing Nigeria, forget it if we don't have electricity. Well, that's a non-starter. The conversation cannot start until we can guarantee at least in our major cities, towns, and villages 24 hours electricity. There was so much power the system that 
some of the conversation we are having now we fizzle out. In fact, I keep saying that you know I'm disappointed about something in this election. The discussion is not elevated enough. It's still very rudimentary and sedentary that we are still discussing how the president wants to provide rules. I have not seen a US president going around commissioning rules before because it's no longer the business of the president of a nation to be running around commissioning rules. You know, or a president that is still having a conversation about agriculture. The president is supposed to be at the policy level of coordinating all these things, making big decisions, making connections and attracting investment, not walking around trying to figure out did they construct the road and they finish it, who is the contractor, all those kind of things, uh, and not the kind of conversation I wish we were having. But for, unfortunately, Nigeria is in need of a builder. You know, uh, it's also fortunate that we have now been able to find people who can build or rebuild Nigeria from the scratch. Security is also key. I mean, you know, the question that I get asked the most is, why? How do you how do you how do you secure yourself in the middle of these big kahunas? You know, very dangerous politicians. But I, I don't answer the questions in the way that people expect an answer. You know, I'm not giving you a security breakdown of how many policemen are walking around with us. No, but I don't have a police unit protecting me. Because with due respect, Nigerian police sometimes, it's better to have an armed robber who is loyal to you. <laughs> no, I'm telling you than to have policemen who, who are following you who you don't trust. And I'm not saying that all of them are bad. But the system, the institution of security, you know, our security architecture in Nigeria has broken down so much and that is what is propelling crime, terrorism the way you see it uh, in Nigeria. So uh, in, in, in all honesty, I wanted to have an interactive moment with all of you, but I needed to speak to so many of these programs that we have because we are in a hurry, honestly, we are in a hurry to get down to business. We are in a hurry if you ask me when is Nigeria supposed to start doing what we are talking about, I'll say yesterday, you know, maybe 58 years ago. But it's, I'm also very scared that the opportunity we have to fix Nigeria is, might slip away. If people don't rise up to the occasion, if they don't step up to the plate, if good people like you don't, you know, step your foot onto the ground and say, look, you don't put your, you know, your heavy foot on the pedal and say, look, this is the position we are taking and this is who we are going with and this is how we are going to support people who have the ideas. The way to analyze this to you is you being an architect, you know, you can design whatever you want to design, you know, the, the best homes in the world, you know, best ideas, but you need an investor who will say, look, what you have designed is beautiful. I'm going to put money into it. You need a bank that can guarantee to make sure that your work is made to completion because if you are the architect and the bricklayer and the carpenter and the painter, you will not be able to achieve much if you don't have the kind of natural support that could come to bring your light, I mean your work to light. That is where we are at this point, is to be able to find the natural support of Nigerians. You know, some of you we know without checking your bank account that you can afford to support this project. You know, you just haven't made up your mind because some of you have supported big politicians in the US who have won election without asking for a contract after that, without even asking whether what they did after that. It's just out of your own personal convictions that's driven you to that. We need you and we need you to talk to others. We need a reenactment of the Karu mostly brown scenario where Chicago can lead this movement of Nigerians working assiduously to take back Nigeria is the reason uh, we made our time to see you today because you know we know you can do it. What do we need? We need just 10,000 Nigerians to give us $200 each. You know, I think there are 60,000 Nigerians in Chicago alone. That's the last time we checked the population of Nigerians 
both the official and unofficial living in Chicago. In Chicago used to be the most prominent Nigerian community based on political activism. You know, based on professionalism, they said it's Maryland, the DMV, that is DC, Maryland, Virginia area. But in terms of you know activism, regardless of whether they are professional or not, Chicago has some of the most you know uh, very very visible Nigerians who are very vocal. Uh, one person told me, I think it was uh, Jesse Jackson's, uh, when I was trying to reach him, and I said I'm from Nigeria, I said, you people are irrepressible, you know. Uh, it's, you know, it doesn't matter who they are, taxi driver, you know, professors, doctors, every Nigerian got an opinion about something, and it's true, it's true. Uh, so, that's, that's why we're here, and that's why I'm here, and uh, I also want to hear from you uh, a lot about what you think uh, we can do because you know we don't have much time on our hands but most importantly we have the conviction that we'll win this election. Nigerians all over the world are tired of the old guys, they're tired of the old cargos. Uh, it is not the fact that they are old that is their crime. It's not, a, it's not an offense to be old. It's the age of their ideas and how that has ruined the possibility that Nigeria presents to be a great nation in the world, on the continent of Africa, to be a true giant in the sun. It is those things that have, you know, galvanized and crystallized the movements that we now lead uh, in Nigeria that has become very popular. So, hey, I want to thank you once again for having me and uh, look forward to a very fruitful conversation. Well, thank you for... Thank you. Thank you for sharing your vision with us. Um, and uh, also, I appreciate the fact that um, it, you don't want to use a room to sweep out all the old people. <laughs> yeah. uh, some of us are now getting to that other side. That's right. But I'm with you. I think we have one of the youngest populations in the world. And in a democracy, you should represent that population. Hey, so, take, it back. Back. take it back. Action. So thank you very much. So we're going to open this up so you actually have that opportunity to have a, a dialogue with us. Um, so I'm going to ask people to be um, as concise and as brief because, as you said, we Nigerians have a voice. <laughs> But um, there, I believe there's a lot of um, input that you can get here, and hopefully we'll get something back from you. Um, Sam, please give your name and then uh, your question, and uh, a minute or so for the question. And uh, my sorry, question is more okay. like an outburst. Okay. I'm once, like, for you. Um, thank you for taking on this. Um, uh, most of us have this joint desire to do what you want. We are limited by some circumstances of finance to do it. But first of all, let me ask you one question. Are you an American citizen? No. You're yeah, not. Okay. What I would have advised is that I would have arranged to have script for you from the United States while you're, you know, gyrating over there. <laughs> so that's very paramount. Your personal security is paramount for, you know, to move forward, you know. And uh, I will encourage you to work more on that. You know, if you don't have that head, you ain't going nowhere. So, so I will personally contribute. Wow. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As I know my people is not putting them down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, first uh, start by saying that I commend you and, and young people like like you, uh, the Duro Toyers and Mike Towns, Mike and Smoga, for actually getting involved in the discussion. Um, unfortunately, as a country, we just seem intent on recycling our leaders from the same filthy database of, uh, of a few hundred men. I remember being in Nigeria in 1983 when Harry took over, and I'm still hearing about Harry, that's nonsense. Yes. yes. Um, but however, given the way that the political structure is in Nigeria, we all know, first of all, I ran for, uh, I'm violating your rules already, sorry, I'm, I get paid to talk, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I uh, raffle uh, elective office in 2011 as a Senate, uh, for Senate State, one of my members to the Senate State uh, seat. And our electorate is largely illiterate. They don't understand uh, big grammar. They don't understand policies. I'm not sure what drives them. Uh, but what I'm afraid of is we have hundreds of political parties, but yeah, people only vote for two of them. How will the younger generation, such as yourself, circumvent that big, what I consider to be a huge problem? Because you and I know this election, the discussion right now is all about PDP and uh, what's the other one called? <laughs> APC. How do you hope to get to inject yourself into the discussion? You are known for being, you know, I, I like it. I watch you on YouTube all the time. Uh, you're a fearless guy, and I really I like uh, <laughs> uh, the way you expose uh, a lot of things that are going on. But how do you get yourself to become a uh, household uh, uh, name? Yeah. Good point. Okay. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's the work of everybody. And uh, you all sat in this town, Chicago, when Obama started. I, I would even say you probably, so many of you got Obama started. When I first heard Obama, my reaction was as good as your reaction, perhaps, if you're in Nigeria, in Anambra State, and you heard Shore today. It's like, who is this guy, you know, with a funny name, right? And, but with the help of everybody, black, white, you know, liberals, progressives, this started like a white fire. And I think we're at the same spot now. Even though you've heard so much about the two major political parties, but if you ask them who they are afraid of, they're not necessarily afraid of a third political party, but they are afraid of the new generation of candidates who have come out, who have somehow forcefully injected themselves into the conversation, political conversations going around in the country. This is not the kind of crowd we get when we go out in Nigeria. People really follow us. They follow us on social media. They follow us physically. I've done 30 states of travel within Nigeria. Probably done over 150 events at this point in which the general consensus is that one, we need a generational shift in you know, leadership. I agree with you completely that it's a likely huge swath of uneducated, illiterate uh, electorates. But they are also tapping into what the educated people are talking about because I think for them, hunger and poverty is a form of education. It's becoming a college degree that you must study if you are to survive in the country. And because of that, we're having uh, a leeway. Another advantage we have had is the power of the diaspora. A lot of the diasporas are pushing for a candidate. They are even in some cases adopting cities and states and funding independently people that we didn't even know or have political affiliation with. Because the truth is this, if we want to compete with, over with, with these guys with money, we will be in the dust by now. I mean, they would have completely eviscerated us. But imagine how with less than $100,000 raised so far, we have been able to become part of the conversation. What I'm trying to say is that it now behooves on people with conscience, wherever they might find yourself, this includes you, because having run for Senate, you have a small constituency, you have a small group of people you talk to. Conversations are going on on a daily basis with illiterates and literate people. You know, there's cross-fertilization of ideas. And you just need to keep injecting this into it. And we've gotten to a point now where there's that realization that there needs to be a generational shift of power from the old cargos, the guys who were around in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, who are still around with us. People who have had political positions and responsibility who failed miserably delivering on those things. People are asking those questions and we are getting a lot of input and support. For example, as you know, $2 million, which is what we are asking for in terms of uh, public donation, is a drop in a bucket, even if you are running for governorship of a state in Nigeria. Is not enough on election day to pay polling booth or polling unit volunteers. It's not enough. 
but what we have had already, which is amazing, is that already people have taken positions around polling units across the country. They are just reaching out to us on their own. I'm in charge of what so so so. I will be in charge of so so please. Or people telling us and said, oh, my brother who is in Germany just paid five of us to be campaigning and be in the polling units in our area. And that's how this is spreading. It's the kind of Obama renaissance that uh, we're having. But does it need more push? Definitely. Can we do better? Well, we can because elections actually, the campaign, uh, they, they, they leave the lead on the campaign ban tomorrow, officially. So up until now, we didn't have the right to publicly campaign. And up until a few weeks ago, I wasn't a candidate, I was an aspirant. But now we have a political party, and our party also have uh, a number of candidates uh, running as senators, governors, as uh, state house of assembly members, and in Undo states we are participating in their local government election as well. So this is our way of showing that we are all over the place. But again, finally, it is important that all of you, all of us, get involved in energizing the new base and particularly directing the conversation the way you opened your statement to say, look, we cannot continue to expect progress if you keep recycling the same old baggage, you know, in this place. Nigeria is not going to make progress. We cannot expect a different result when we are making the same mistake every election cycle. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for There's a boy there. No, ignore him. <laughs> no, no, be next. Yes, you'll be next, fella. <laughs> and thank you for all your aspirations and your foreknowledge. Uh, you mentioned that um, the Carlos Brown and Obama thing. Yes, I think I'm Jamie, I think Jane, myself, we were part of the people who raised money. Mm. For Obama, even before he was known, yeah. he was a local organizer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't grow up in Chicago. Actually, I lived in Chicago <laughs> before Obama yeah, came to yeah. Chicago. Wow. So he was running around the neighborhood. We were following, I mean, we knew that this guy has something on him because he did. we raised money for him before he became the presidential candidate. He, about the train. He ran for I'm sorry, I'm going to go down to he ran for congressman <laughs> yeah. and, and state yeah. senator yeah. against yeah. Bobby Rush. Right. Right. He lost yeah. woefully. Yeah. 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 Bobby Rush trashed him. Mm -hmm. Then he went back and regrouped. And then he became like we were one of his foot soldiers. Mm. And he acknowledged us in his book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we used to have an organization called OLDP. Yeah. And we raised, he came to our organization as a guest speaker. Yes. We invited him, he came. We gave him a reception. Even that, uh, you know, I'm sorry. Anyway, we did that for him. And he became known. And he has an idea. And he has people who, uh, who believed in him. That's one thing he has going for him. And he was very fortunate. He came out at the right time. And I think, again, you are coming out at the right time. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. But there is a lot of work that needs to be done. One thing that he did was he, I believe, was the very first candidate to use his technology to galvanize the masses to donate money, number one. I don't know, did you guys have GoFundMe pay? Yeah. No, actually, before, before I, did you, are you, is this TID, is it registered in the United States? Yes. Do you have, uh, what, 501c3? Yeah. Yeah, let's it. It's just registered. Okay. Well, but we have GoFundMe account. Sorry. Okay, so we don't know, I, so maybe... And look for me, we, we raised over $96,000 on the sofa. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good step in the yeah. right direction. So, he was the first one to use that platform to governize the people. And hopefully, they, I did mention that the Nigerian, uh, Nigeria has the most 
young people between the ages of 25 and 40. Yes. So, I mean, you have to be able to reach these people. And when I was in high school, Atiku was the head of U.S. Custom, mm -hmm. and now he's still in the government running for the president. When is it going? Is the time for young people? I mean, like three generations of Nigeria have been wasted. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I, I just very passionate. I know. Even uh, you told me came here in 2004. Mm -hmm. yeah. We organized. We raised a lot of money for you, told me. A lot of uh, candidates from Chicago raised money. But the point is that it, this is a big task to undertake based on the political structure and organization in Nigeria. So, how are you going to overcome, number one, the foot soldier, and number two, use this uh, internet now, again, I believe my kids has mm. what's called Instagram and mm -hmm. WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, all this other thing that mm -hmm. I don't use. So. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> so, you need to Twitter. Need to Twitter. <laughs> This Twitter, I've never tweeted in my life. <laughs> so, so I can believe maybe have you been able to, you know, use all this platform to get you uh, to become a household name, like someone has yeah. said, and, and and that, you know, I, I need to. Yeah, yeah. This is a very quick way. Uh, we do very well on uh, social media, uh, but as you raise. In Nigeria, you need foot on the ground, and, and then we have been able to. We have figured out how to mobilize students based on, I mean, young people, based on our antecedents as young student leaders uh, that have been around for over 40 years. I'm sorry, 30 years now doing young. I mean, mobilization of young people. You know, we did it during June 12. Very well known. Uh, there's ample evidence on the internet. If you do, you see. It. And a lot of people are following us. What has been our major problem, of course, is funding. If, if I had someone who could call us as scientists and say, this $2 million you're looking for is here, go back to Nigeria and show us what you can do, you will be shocked. You know, I, I mean, we'll probably, at that point, spend less than $2 million and we'll come back with a lot of change. I mean, real change, not chicken change that the APC people did. Uh, in Nigeria within such a short time because we know how to reach people. We have been able to galvanize and mobilize all these young people. We have been able to show to them that the ideas are there, locked in the system, and that we can put this country in a lockbox where, you know, development will meet the lethargy of the past and we shatter all the myth about why Nigeria is not developing or should be a developed country at this point. because. We have lived through 58 years of people making excuses for failure. And the country keeps rewarding people who failed the country. The first time I heard about Atiku was in 1992, when I was a student at the University of Lagos. He was running against Abiola during the SDP Just Convention. 1992. 19, between 1992, the guys who were born in 1992 are all married now. So many of them have had kids, and Atiku is still our major presidential candidate. The first time I came across Buhari was in 1983, of course, when I was in secondary school year two. The first time I came across Adu Ogbe, who is the current <laughs> Minister of Agriculture, was in 1979. I studied him in social studies. No, I'm serious. <laughs> We heard about him, I think he was the youngest minister around that period. Shagari. Yeah? Shagari, Shagari South Shagari. So, the same minister of agriculture, we studied him in social studies. And this is 2018. He's still your minister of agriculture. Buhari is still going to be the presidential candidate of the APC. Atiku, who I met, who I heard about in 1992, is going to be the presidential candidate of the PDP. And in fairness to Nigeria youth, when they come out and say they want to run for office, the first thing they try to you is experience. Mm -hmm. And you, I ask them, how do people garner experience when you don't let them govern? 
when you don't let them aspire to leadership. I'm 47 years old. That means, as at the point I'm running to become president of Nigeria, I was, I'm probably then older than Obama when he became the president of the U.S. So if the U.S. can give an Obama an opportunity to be their president with 300 million people or plus, and you know trillions of economy, about 18 trillion economy to manage, my country of maybe 50 billion, I mean 500 billion dollar economy mm -hmm. is telling me that I'm too young and that I have experience at 47 even though I have consistently fought for the betterment of the country over 30 years. This is one of the myths we have to shatter. Let me uh, reveal something to you here. And this is particular about gentlemen of your age. Someone asked me if my campaigning is not alienating people in their 60s. And I said to him, this was uh, in London last week, I mean in the UK last week, that people of, in their 60s, they owe us an apology. Yes. That they did not stand up for us when they should. So anytime we're asking for a donation of $200, you owe us $600. Yes. <laughs> Take it back. Take it back. Action. No, I, you, you, you mentioned something there. Um, again, I, I tell people all the time, when you look at all the um, people who actually started all these nations, even Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, the Azikwe's, mm -hmm. the Awolowas, oh, and the, the they were in their 20s and their 30s yes, yes, yes. <laughs> when well, they I'm did that. Um, and um, it, it's always been a, a point of contention. As a matter of fact, uh, I had the conversation with my honorable architect there. I said, you know, I don't want to speak to anybody under 50. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me, over 50 mm -hmm. who wants to run for this office. You know, that really it should be those young people who still have a lot to give. Um, the advantage that some of us in our 60s have is that we actually saw a wonderful Nigeria. Yeah. We can point to a Nigeria where the trains ran well, mm -hmm. where we actually traveled mm -hmm. by railways, mm -hmm. and it was the best accommodation you could have, where the, where, the roads, where the roads were actually good. And, um, and a wonderful infrastructure. So, anyway, I want to give our young man here his yes. opportunity to ask his question. Uh, it was not really a question, it was a comment. Okay, okay. that's welcome. Go ahead, man. I felt like the main goal. Is, What's your name, sir? Bella. Um, I feel like the main goal is to get the um, popular vote. Um, the popular vote, I feel like, is one of the most important parts in the election. So um, just to get anything done, sponsor sponsorships, um, anything, um, just will help us get um, the popular vote when it comes to it, just getting the goal when it comes to money and everything. Wow. And um, social media, um, just if anybody could download any of the most popular social media will also help us what the popular vote is. Wow. A campaign manager. Future Sahara. Before the next person, I want to actually, uh, you know, speaking of money, because money does run things. <laughs> and I've been in a campaign or two. Uh, tickets for the dinner that is tonight are available after this event, so please don't leave without it. Um, Where is it? Where is it? The tickets are here, sir. Okay. Where is the Do you want to tell us what the venue? Uh, 4930 South College Hills, Francisco. Okay. Oh, Hills. All right. So he's got the tickets in his hands. All right. So I will go to you, and then I'll come back. Go. Oh, and then I'll come back. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. I tell you. Okay. Before he speaks, yes. Um, I can tell that the number of uh, people in here is increasing. Sure. And uh, we had already made an agreement that uh, if this room can take the number of people anymore, then okay. we can proceed to the general office where okay. we can sit comfortably. All right. Yeah. No, well, well, I think people are fine so far. So let's let's move on. We're fine. Okay. Because shifting will change. Yeah, shifting yeah. will disrupt things. Yeah. Right. Please. We're on a roll. So my name is Faye, I'm also an aspiring uh, architect. And uh, 
I'm going to try to summarize the question as briefly as I can. Um, I'm going to start with when you win. Yeah. Let me do it yeah. that way. When you win, we know that starting going into a system of, of running something, whether it's a business, a country, a community, especially one like Nigeria that has so many inefficiencies, mm -hmm. is going to take time to get into those. I mean, the people that have been born in Nigeria. To get ahead is to corrupt. Mm -hmm. To get ahead is to find ways to, to get better than the other person. So you're st we're still going to deal with that. I mean, there's so many stories you heard about people going back and still having to deal with those situations, even with some of the past, the present that being recycled. They have ideas, they go there, and they're still faced with not dealing with the situation. Like you said, someone um, decides to fix fix infrastructure, but it doesn't, they, they give money out, but mm. for some reason, that money gets stopped somewhere. Mm. How do you intend to deal with those inefficiencies? You know, it's, uh, it's just to let you know that uh, my 12 years running Sahara reporters was, you know, not only pointing fingers at inefficiencies, we're actually fishing out inefficient people and how monies are being diverted, monies that were meant for development yeah. are being diverted. So what I've done for 12 years is actually chasing the money that ought to have been used in building hospitals, schools, that end up being used to buy jets, mansions across not only Nigeria but across the world. But you know what I've discovered in my little time in Nigeria is that you can start making things work if you want things to work. Mm -hmm. I went to Nigeria in 2017. I started a lab in Lagos. And where did I start from? Is to ask the guy who was designing the place that I needed toilets to be properly fixed and functioning. Because I discovered that you can hardly find a toilet to use in Nigeria, including the airport. Mm -hmm. When you arrive in Nigeria, there's a sanitation problem. And Probably that's my pet peeve. And I was surprised that the moment the toilet was put a certain way, people used it differently from when I met it, when I arrived. So I don't want to see buckets in the toilet, right? That means that water must be running. And there was no time I went in there that the toilet wasn't clean. Second, we said we want electricity in the place, but it meant that you buy a generator and that diesel was supplied you know, from time to time. And anytime we wanted electricity, electricity was available. And it made people to produce more. But thirdly, I, this idea of a minimum wage of 100,000, I experimented with it. But guess what? As soon as I arrived in Nigeria, they targeted the business, just so that you can understand, sued me to court in Ilorin, the Senate president, all the money I brought was frozen because they know that that idea will have an infectious you know, impact. That if that business were to succeed, people can look at it and say, but you already brought a business here that worked. Mind you, I had done the same thing in New York for 11 years before I went to Nigeria with it. I was sued, but no judge, I was sued four times in the US, no judge ever froze my account. Because they knew that I'm doing media business and until the case had been exhausted, you have no right. Even after you win a case of libel, judges don't freeze your account. But in Nigeria, the judge froze the account first before the case was heard. <laughs> you know so the fact is that people who don't produce anything, who don't invent, cannot you know, uh, incubate ideas. Yes. So the moment to bring leaders that can, you know, that can produce, that understand how things work, they can incubate ideas. I tell you, for example, anytime I'm passing through the Nigerian airport, which is the Moritala Mohammed International, and I travel through the place frequently, I wonder why Nigeria cannot maintain four toilets. Yes, the nation of Nigeria cannot maintain four decent toilets at its biggest and busiest there should be nothing less than 20 toilets in that place. But there are only four that I know of. Each time we cry, 
they will go and give a contract to do another one, but go inside the place and film it. Someone has used a paper uh, sticker to wrap something there. The paints are not what was originally brought. The first, you know, uh, uh, toilet seat is always different from the body of the toilet because there are different suppliers. Mm -hmm. The person supplying the bowl is different from the person supplying the toilet seat or the person supplying the bowl at the back or the pipe. You know, and you are wondering, why do Nigeria need contractors to buy different things that you can buy from one place? So the moment you start eliminating these kind of practices, and it all boils down to leadership. It is the leadership that Nigeria doesn't have that Ghana has got now that brought some of the best terminals to Ghana. Have you not heard about Ethiopia? Ethiopia just launched an intracity train system. Where do you think it came from? It came from leadership. They are building a high-speed rail between Kenya and Ethiopia. And all of the people who have been corrupt in the Ethiopian system were just rounded up recently because they are the ones that have been impeding the progress of that country. It's leadership. The moment you have leaders who can make these things work, at least some basic things will start working immediately. It, Lagos was used as an, as an example because Lagos has a paradoxical thing. Whenever they want Lagos to work, Lagos works based on Tinubu's interest. If they don't want it to work, Lagos will not work. Mm -hmm. But you imagine when they want Lagos to work, how things work in Lagos. The traffic system used to be very good. At the time, it was clean. But when they got upset with themselves, they would shut down everything. That is why nations can also not run on the whims and caprices of individuals. They have to you know, develop on the platform of institutions that are created over time. But truth is that institutions don't fall from the, from the skies. They are created by leaders who are very visionary. And it is when vision meets action that you have nations work is like a spark. And you'll be surprised at how Nigeria can move in a different direction if you have the right leadership next year. You'll be asking, oh, I sat in the same room with this guy. I didn't know that things could work so quickly, so fast. But it can and it will when we win, and I like the adjective you yeah. use there, you know, because some people have been, you know, mistakenly using the word if. <laughs> yes, but we will win this, and when we do so, you'll be proud of this historical moment that we are sharing here today. Well, we really appreciate your, your time. Uh, we will thank you for coming to and I would say the problems of Nigeria are like that of a mosquito at a nudist colony. Where do you begin? <laughs> so we can be here all day long speaking. I didn't, hear, I didn't know about this idea. <laughs> well, I have many of those. <laughs> but um, uh, in the interest of time and also knowing that you have an event tonight, we really want to you know, uh, make sure that we um, preserve some of that time and We'll curtail some of the discussions because you've you've got us started. Uh, I'm, I have three other people who yeah. will ask questions, and then I think, uh, uh, with all due respect, um, we can then talk to you off record. <laughs> right? So, um, Mr. Dada, <laughs> my brother, and then you. Okay, so you go first. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much. You know, uh, you know, relatively. I think uh, you've been hitting the right point on your speeches, you know, during your campaign. You know, there was a particular one when they almost cut my head on the minimum wage of 100,000, yeah. which I've, you know, uh, recommended in the past, you know, which they, wow. they almost killed me. <laughs> so, and, and in the Nigerian Diaspora Forum, they, they still say, how do you want to pay for it? Yeah. And I say, okay, 100,000 for a graduate, is that too much? That's you know, less, less than three hundred dollars. Uh, uh, so, so the question now is, I follow Lumumba. Yes. You know, and what is? I mean, he said it constantly. Which he said in Maryland recently too, that those who have ideas yes. don't have power. Yeah. Those who have power don't oh, have ideas. Yes. You know, and the way Nigeria is right now, I mean, he used himself as an example that Iran. Yes. But uh, it's opposition, you know. 
you know, so gather money, gather money, <laughs> and throw it overnight. And war, and war. You know. So how will you be able to get all of that candidates? Are you about ninety or forty? How many of? Them? Well, right now, officially there are fifty-six presidential candidates. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. So, so fifty-six and. So it means there are 54 outside the two major ones. Yes. Okay. Uh, I believe seriously that uh, you will have to find a way of getting most of those people, you know, to believe in your vision, which is what brought Buhari to power too, with the uh, help of Abiola, I mean, Tinubu. So what do you, how do you want to sell your ideas to them to, so that they will not break all those people? And deliver them to either PDP or ABC with the use of money. Yes. Okay. Well, this has been ongoing. Uh, you probably have heard some efforts being made constantly to bring younger presidential, although there are 50 something presidential aspirants. Uh, in our view, they're not more than four or five that are serious. And that's the truth. Right. In fact, we come across other presidential candidates and, you know, they, I, I have to remind them when they're hailing that you're also a presidential candidate, so, you know, we just, <laughs> just did there now. So, the people have come to recognize that. But I agree with you that probably a few more of other uh, respectable presidential candidates can come together and bond together. But what is most important is that when that is not achievable for circumstantial reasons, is for the candidates who are serious to drive a coalition of persons and not a coalition of parties. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who are even bigger than parties out there who are been abandoned, disenfranchised, abused by the political system, who are ready to come under the banner of our political party and who have been supporting us you know the diaspora we had a conversation when we arrived here that if there was diaspora voting which we will be planning for the inauguration by now <laughs> yeah because when we tested our strength in diaspora over 80 something percent of people in diaspora support our dream and they are not only talking about it they are acting upon their desires and aspirations as well by investing at home. In fact, the joke now is that people are calling home and say, if you don't vote for Shore, I'm not sending you money until you vote, things like that. But people are serious because even when we were mobilizing for PVC, the diaspora played a major role in making sure that people at home went and collected their voters uh, card or they were registered as voters. So these things will happen, but I believe and this is important for you to understand that the way we are driving this conversation, the energy we are bringing into it, the stamina, the policies that we are driving, the conversations that are going on, will make it very clear to others who are still on, you know, operating under the radar uh, that a coalition of this nature will need their help and they will naturally fall in. Because with due respect, we are distinctively different because our revolution, I mean, our messages are pretty revolutionary. And a lot of the candidates, younger candidates, are not willing to offend the system. They are navigating cautiously. Mm -hmm. But our position is very clear. Our position, we have very clear position on minimum wage, on the power sector, on the cabals ruling the country, and the elder statesmen who think that we should come to their living room to come and ask for their blessing, you know, institutions of traditional and religious connotations. We are very clear about how we want to relate with these power, you know, power blocks. And some of them are not happy with us, but the majority of our people, the coalition of the willing, are very happy that this, our messaging is very clear, distinct, precise, and laconic as to what we want to do and what we're about. And that makes me really happy about the way we have progressed. And we have made a lot of progress. Don't forget that all of all the younger candidates that are now within the horizon, we came last on the scene. I came into this game in February, March. Several others have been around a year, clearly a year before me, 
but we have surpassed you know every thing that needs to be done we have surpassed them in you know in terms of travel in terms of engagement in terms of you know acceptance reach in terms of diversity even in terms of using technology in a way that it has not been used before for example we are the only candidate in the race using crowdsourcing i mean crowdsourcing fund in a way there's no candidate in nigeria that has raised up to ninety thousand dollars before on gofundme to fund an election anywhere in nigeria we are the first so there's a lot of innovative ways that we are doing this and we'll continue to do it again we seek your support and you'll be surprised yeah. thank you man. thank you for sir. your vision and uh, your aspiration and of course i've been uh, studying politics for a long time both nigeria here my question is this uh, how do you intend to get into the career politics you know basically in nigeria we still play career politics you go to the uh Emma, go to the oba go to the ob okay i'm going to deliver this number of people to you and uh, how do you bring to the to the students here? Yeah, how do you get them involved? And uh, how much media do you get local Nigerian media? Even though they probably funded by Babangida or Atuku, you know, you've got to be realistic. The, the, you know, the, the forces that we try to undermine uh, your aspiration. Well, uh, thank you. So, you know, there's something we know as a tripod of the Nigerian political system and our engagement. You know, of course, tribalism, religion, uh, and just money is what has been driving politics, not ideals, ideology, or conviction. And that's where we're moving away from. I have traveled and visited a number of traditional rulers. But if you ask me personally, and I'm being honest, it's a waste of time. Thank you. Yes, it is. Yes. It, is, it is sheer waste of time. The, the traditional institutions have sold their soul. They have sold their soul to conventional politicians. It doesn't matter how long you stay in their palaces, as long as you don't have something to drop. You are wasting your time. And they have no votes to really deliver to you. You know, the same thing with the you know, uh, religious organizations or groups. They are vacillating left and right. Today they are for Jesus. The other, the other day they are for devil. They have justification for wherever they swing. They are like swingers. They don't have loyalty to any particular cause. Not all of them. You know, there are still people within the religious organizations that have conscience. So, but there is also a place for the critical mass in the country that we have never explored before. And these are young people, students, <coughs> educated people, even people who go to church who don't necessarily worship pastors. There are, there are a lot of independent thinkers in the country, but we've never paid attention to them because we always thought that, oh, if you don't go to the mainstream media, nobody can hear your message. The question is, what is mainstream these days? What used to be mainstream media has become mainstream. I led the movement for, you know, a diversification of media in the country, and it has paid off today. I have not put a billboard anywhere in Nigeria, largely because I cannot afford it. Yes, I have not done a single radio jingle, or paid a reporter to interview me. But the little that we have done. It circulated all over the place. I give you an example. My visit to the Emir of Kano, Sanusi, who used to be Central Bank Governor, was circulated all over the country simply because not because I visited, but because of the content of the interaction we had. The interview I had with the Minister of Communication, she too oh, in a bad, oh, or Minister of Miscommunication, as I like to call went viral, not within the mainstream media. But within the main street media, which is driven by internet, and it was a defining moment for our campaign or the yearning for generational change in Nigeria. So, as much as I love to spend money on local media, I would rather that we keep developing new outlets for reaching our people. I will tell you categorically today 
that WhatsApp is the biggest billboard in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. yes. If you can get your message out there, translated you know, in small bits and pieces to people, put in Yoruba, Hausa, they send it, it circulates faster. When I started my campaign, I put a small poster on WhatsApp. It went viral. In a few days, everybody's calling. That's how I started. And I then had all these local media people lining up, can we interview you? And that was how some of the interviews came about that, that went viral. But truth is that the moment they saw that we were becoming visible, the people who own the local media reined them in. You no longer get the invitations like you used to have them. Even when you do, they make it clear that you have to drop something. And I don't have something to drop for anybody. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Exactly. So, so we've been having that struggle. But it's, it's a good struggle to have because what will happen is that in the process of this development that we're having, a new media culture will also emerge for campaigning that cannot be interrupted by people with what we call long truth in Nigeria or people who feel that they command how you enter into the media space and how to muzzle you out of it. It's the same way Sahara reporters came about. SARS and ladies, when we started, everybody made fun of me. How are you going to do it? Who are you? Who is your father? You know, who do you think you are? How are you going to campaign? Where will you get the money from? Some people gave me benevolently, say, if I give you two weeks, this thing will, 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 will just die a natural death. Some of them are my friends. How can you go and compete and fight with Babangida? Uh, and then at the point is, when are you going to see Oba Sanjo? When will you go to Babangida's house? Uh, if you don't go to those people, nobody can vote for you in Nigeria. I swore to them openly. It's not going to happen. Good. Yes, I'm not going to Oba Sanjo's house because I believe they belong in the past. And they must be retired into a baby. Hey, 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 sir. Take it back. Take it back. Action. So, finally, just a, a full comment. Um, yeah. So, uh, you need to talk to your coordinators. Yes. Uh, because obviously, I still have a, a small uh, setup. Yes. From my uh, foray into politics some time ago. I can send, send word out okay. to. I had a question for you. You know they had this coalition of uh, parties. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't tell you a Is that correct? Yeah. They well, are you are you part of that? No, I was. Uh, so what you, you were not part of that. It's part. Part is what it was called. Yeah. yeah. So they had the coming together of younger presidential spirit, and I attended the first meeting. But I made a suggestion like when I got there immediately. It's not necessary to have presidential aspirants determine the fate of who would become presidential candidates. Why don't we wait and become presidential candidates of our respective parties first, mm -hmm. so that we can weed out all the, you know, uh, wannabes? <laughs> and uh, they rejected it, mm -hmm. and I pulled out, and I didn't participate beyond that. So eventually, Drew Tui and Mogalu uh, went to another and Drotwe defeated Mogalu at that event. And Mogalu pulled out saying that he cannot accept uh, Drotwe's uh, defeat. And so that's how Pact ended. Another one uh, took place recently, which is still ongoing. Uh, it's, I, I cannot comment on the outcome, uh, but what I told them is that we are probably entered injury time. So changing of players may not make some of the best uh, but every effort that can be made to narrow the number of serious contenders against these old cargoes is welcome. If even if we don't have, you know, a single candidate, if it comes back to saying, okay, there are three left, you know, and we are five, is between now Buhari, Atiku, you know, you can Atiku hallucinate as you want. But Nigeria is not going to go the route of uh, yeah. Nigeria is not going to go the way of Atiku or you, uh, you wow. call yourself a Buharist, whatever it is. There are clear, you know, distinctions between the old guards on one side and the younger candidates. In fact, it doesn't make complete sense to have one single young candidate because what if they crush one person last minute? 
these guys are they are not going to be playing the moment they see that the, the, the fight becomes very strong. But most importantly, what I keep telling them, and this is my final word, is if you are going to fight against these people, put your best foot forward. You, we are not playing a defensive game. This is an offense. You know, it has to be that you put in the roughest, the most rugged, and someone that has experience as a fighter. Hey, hey see, yes. take, it take, it back. take it back. Action. Because whether you like it or not, it's, this is not just an election. This is a revolution we are trying to pull. Yes. So you don't want a presidential candidate who gets to a point and suddenly realizes that, oh my God, I've never been to prison before. <laughs> yeah. and now prison is staring me in the face. I don't want to do. You need those of us who have been in and out of prison, you know, be shot at, survived, expelled. So we, in, and these guys actually know us. They know if you ask them who is it that can confront you and give you a nightmare, they will point to the Sahara Reporters guy. <laughs> that guy is crazy. But, yes, but it will also be their interest because they are watching actively that will present, you know, what they call body. Yeah. Someone who is like butter, who will melt, you know, in front of fire. So that's that's what I tell them that is the holistic truth about how to approach choosing a young candidate that will confront the old guys. Well, thank you very much. Um, oh, oh. Well, we try to do that. Okay. Okay. So, oh. <laughs> Okay. And uh, the young guys. Uh, well, welcome back. Is that a turn already? So, uh, my name is Alas Nuache. I'm from the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Lagos. And I knew Lagos. I grew up downtown Lagos. I knew Kingsway was working. I knew City, I mean, the boss system. I knew Lagos. When you stop at LSD, 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 LSD,
So, my question to you again, because I've had your name like about a year ago, just like uh, the younger kids who come to my office because uh, what I do, I meet with a lot of Nigerians. And the guy was like, yo, we're going, these are younger generation guys. We are going, we're going for uncle, you have a show ring. I'm like, if not for him, I probably would like another Obama thing. <laughs> like, okay. Because the, I really look at Nigeria that, I used to think, I used to think we are very smart people. <laughs> But the more I look at us, the more I critically analyze us, I say we are not smart. Because if we are smart, we shouldn't have allowed what is going on in Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah, we're so, we're please, now ourselves. the big question is, are you going to look into those things and resolve this to the point that we can all stand and look back to save Nigeria that we We can raise ourselves, go back and retire there without, without worrying about... Because if, if all of us here go to Nigeria, I'll give you one year, well done. <laughs> it's a reality. So, <laughs> yeah, let, let me take another okay. question before. That's, that's the last question. Last question. Yeah. Okay, well, so I can answer both. Please, okay. My name is Excellent. I understand the geographical complexity of our country, but mm -hmm. the only t only area that I've not been hearing about is the fact that your effort in the northern part of Nigeria, which I know is uh, quite a number of population. So, as my question to you is that, has there been any Effort that you've been making in the number of projects of Nigeria and I'm trying to give you a better leverage in terms of this uh, 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 campaign I'm doing. No, yeah. Good question. And, and Good question. To, to, to wrap the question, and you can take the order. One thing I know is you are trying to run for the presidency in Nigeria. Two things happen. Are you willing to be jailed and are you willing to lose your life? Yeah. Those two things you have to take them into consideration. You can answer them. He said that. He said he's going to do it. Yeah. He's been there before. So, okay. So, the question is. My question has to do with what he has mentioned before, which is a $100,000 minimum wage. Naira. $100,000. Naira minimum wage. Okay. $100,000 Naira minimum wage. But the question is how do you control inflation? due to that, and how do you regulate market prices to, I mean, and stop people from uh, increasing their commodity or products, you know, without check? Thank you. We, we saw with Doji. Udoji is an example. The moment the Udoji was paid, the moment the Udoji was paid, all the market women increases their prices. So there has to be regulation. And just in separate questions. Uh, my name is Ogubwa. And uh, you know, the gentleman asked a question. I said, uh, is sure he would give his life and his, um, you know, go to jail. I'm not sure why. But when I see it as personally, and I can commit to you without any iota of question that he will deliver his life if he has to. <laughs> Take it back. back. Take it back. Ah, sure. this, uh, let me start with the minimum wage. Okay. Uh, let, let me say something before yeah. you start. Mm -hmm. I would like to follow up with what he said. Yeah. What you need to advocate, mm -hmm. and I'm giving you an idea, is not about this individual infrastructure. We need a system. You need to use that language. Mm -hmm. Well, it's system of everything, infrastructure, system of governance, system of uh, health system, system of power. That's what will work. That's how America functions. And talking about security, for example, it's not going, I'm giving you ideas, it's not going from calling the police. How security works in America and why it has worked is that the police is separated from what? The emergency system. You need to know that you have to articulate that system where you don't call the police. You say it to them and they will start seeing the difference between you and Atiku and, and that idiot. Okay, so <laughs> you start articulating those kind of injecting things in a systematic way and say, okay, you don't call the police, you call the emergency system, which will now coordinate with the police to get to where they, to secure them, to secure the environment, to bring safe environment to them. On that That's note, what let's hear from the candidates. Thank you so much for yeah. the I wanted to start with um, 100,000 Naira minimum wage. And uh, when you talk about minimum wage in Nigeria, 
for us is to start talking about living wage. Yeah. Yes, and living wage is different from minimum wage. Minimum wage is the legally allowable amount of money you pay to a worker. Minimum wage is the amount of money that can make a worker perform optimally as a worker. And what we have done is look at how many workers are out there in Nigeria and what it will cost Nigeria every year to pay them a minimum wage that can at least help them survive. What we should start the conversation with is if 18,000 Naira, which is equivalent of $30, can help anybody who is working anywhere to deliver optimally on their responsibility. The answer is no. In any, and we have also moved to other economies in Africa that are at par with that of Nigeria and found out that they are paid, even Libya is paying over $475 per month as their minimum wage. Calculate that in Naira. It's more than this 100,000. That is what ton Libya. You want to go to Angola? We have compared everywhere else and found that Nigeria's minimum wage is criminally low or too low for anybody to live up on. But the most important question you should ask yourself is how much is it will it cost us? It costs us just $1.5 billion more to pay Nigerian workers the minimum wage that we're talking about. And how much are we paying people who are the least productive in our society? Mm, the, senators. <laughs> the senators, for example, who are taking home 13.5 million naira every month as their allowances. That is different from their salary. So what we did, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can, can you help me do the salary calculator just there quickly? We, we constructed, because I like to respond technically to this, we constructed a salary calculator on our website, it is on Shorea 2019. And we said to people, compare your salary with that of a Nigerian senator. And the person earning a minimum wage of 18,000 Naira a month, it would take the person 37 years to earn the salary of a senator per month. That's the starting point, because we have to have this argument in terms of conscience. Then let's come to the economics of it. If you give people 100,000, what do they do with it? They invest locally, small businesses grow. It increases the purchasing power of an average worker. But you are not, okay, have you done it? So, yes, 100,000. Compare with Oga Senator in Abuja. So it will take you 11 years and three months to earn Nigerian senators if you are earning a minimum wage. 11, 11 years. Yeah. And then we then compare to start that of South Africa. In South Africa, they earn 16,000, they, they earn 16 million naira more than you in a year. Ghana earns 6 million more than you in a year. Kenya earns 7 million more than you in a year. Niger. And seven million naira more than you. Zambia earns five million more than you. Mauritius and nine million. Morocco earns thirteen million more than you in a year. UN earns twenty-seven million more than you. Canada twenty-four million. Mexico, Brazil, Europe, United Kingdom twenty-five million naira more than you in a year. But you can say to yourself, the comparison may not make sense for US, Canada, and other places. But it does make sense. That Niger, Niger is doing better than we are doing. Niger, yes. So I'm breaking this down to you. So, but the question you ask yourself is if you are looking for a modern or modernized civil service, do you pay them peanuts and expect them to perform wonders? Definitely, you are wasting your time. So if you want productivity, if you want to eradicate corruption, motivate people. I think somebody mentioned it here just now as we're having this conversation that what will it take for people to do what they need to do in Nigeria with that what will it take for a customs guy to let you in without asking you to drop your uh, palm oil when you are leaving Nigeria for them it has to do with how you motivate and incentivize your workers it is because they have to have self-esteem based on but as long as you don't pay them you can put all the rules and regulations in place you can put cameras everywhere, people will still beg at the airport. 
because it's a you know it's an existential threat. The salary of an Nigerian worker is an existential threat to their own existence. They have to send children to school. They have to go to hospital. But most importantly and finally, this has to come with other sectors. You have to improve power. You have to improve productivity in the country. You have, everything else has to improve for this to be meaningful. But do you know that if Nigeria's Naira were to be strengthened, 18,000 Naira would have been equivalent to 56,000 Naira if the Naira had value. So this has to do with also making sure that the Nigerian currency is strengthened. Such that 18,000 Naira, if the Naira was exchanging for a hundred dollar, I mean hundred Naira to a dollar, it would mean that the minimum wage is even higher at the same rate. So finally, we had something that we put out yesterday and we said if a senator earning 30 million Naira don't cause inflation, how can a worker earning 30,000 cause inflation? Excellent. And it is the people who are earning 30 million that are, cause, that are complaining about the inflation yeah. that will be caused by people yeah. earning 30,000. And you see the paradox. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, our, our brother here oh, asked no, no, about no, no, how no, to no. return to the status quo. Okay. I hate to disappoint you. We cannot go back to no. the old past. That's obsolete. No. We need to move forward. Yeah. You, know. mm. you see, I would love for you to still have Kingsway, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But we need more of America mm. and Lagos, mm -hmm. which can cater for the population that expanded. We need a technologically driven water system, we need a trade system that moves faster than what... I went on a train in Lagos about three weeks ago. If you look at the internet, you will see my video. Uh, it's the fastest moving train in the world at 13 kilometers per hour. <laughs> <laughs> Locomotive is still there. Actually, my idea was... Yeah. Like, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not disputing your idea. No, I, I, I understand what you're asking. If you, if you walk, if you walk, what you just said, yeah. clearly, yeah. 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 what you said is that Whatever matters, it's not the if you the naira, yeah. it's what the value you can for you. Yes. And the other idea is if you work as a custom officer, um, teacher, yes, um, CTA driver, mm -hmm. you should be able to take care of your bills, send your yeah. Yeah, exactly. health care. That's the whole idea. I understand, sir. That's and what that's what I'm respect within the community. That's absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So, so I know I, I, this time is... Uh, well, it, it's really I, I, your time. We have a chance tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah. I'll answer some it, questions. It's your time. Yeah. Um, I, I really... I, I, um, I personally am very happy to have met you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the quality of your candidacy. It's now a candidacy. Yeah. I appreciate the bold vision. Um, and your... History says that you at least know what the issues are, and we appreciate that. Um, there is a commitment. We don't want you. You shouldn't have to die in order to, leave, you know. But there is a there is a saying. <laughs> Many of them. But yeah. One I will live with you, and the Americans around here will appreciate it. That uh, in a ham and egg sandwich, mm. the chicken is contributing. Wow. But the pig is committed. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> we all want to contribute. We don't want you to be the pig. Yeah. But for those who want to contribute, candidates have been, have run for office. Yeah. I've run for office in Chicago where uh, people were talking about security. Mm. I needed security. Yeah. On the west side of Chicago when I was running for Cook County Commissioner. So take care of yourself, please. Don't take anything for granted. Um, we we want to see you at your inauguration. Invite you all. You see, and not have to go somewhere else. You know, I uh, wish you well. We wish the party itself well. And uh, yeah, money runs a lot of things, and um, I encourage people to to dig in and participate. Um, you've been very. Uh, forthcoming. Uh, it's been a wonderful dialogue. I appreciate the contribution of everybody in the room. And um, 
Finally, the Arabs have a saying, they say, pray to Allah, but tie your camel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody use the donation amount that you want to donate? If not now, if not today, you know, we want you to promise. Promise me this. Promise so, so there is a list going around, and yeah. I put my name in. So, <laughs> um, and, and yeah, can you tell us what is the event tonight? Yes, yes sir. Oh, 20 for tonight, 20 South Cottage Grove. 30. For tonight, 30. For tonight, 30. That's the Air Francisco High School, right? Yes, sir. Yes. 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 And we have to get yeah, some tickets out there. Yeah, 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 the tickets for us. Uh, yeah. 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 They have to be done now. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it has spoken already. And uh, cash. Plus. Oh, cash. Credit card. Credit card. Credit card. Credit card. All means <laughs> of uh, yes, sir. payment and bills. And uh, good morning or good afternoon to all of you. So this is go, <laughs> this is go for me at page. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So somebody might get upset here and just make it 100000 you have other candidates that's running yes. uh, parallel with you for state rep, state governor, uh, state, state senator. And we have uh, over our party is uh, less than three months old, it was just recently registered. We have about seven to ten senatorial uh, candidates, over ten governorship candidates. Uh, we have almost a uh, hundred House of Rep uh, candidates, and we also have over a hundred and thirty State House of Assembly candidates who are running in election. So the presidential election and the Senate and House of Rep is on February 16, 2018. March 2nd, sorry, sorry, 2019, uh, 2019, because 2018 is past, yes. March 2nd, 2019 is the one for governorship and the House of, uh, in the, in the State House of Assemblies. The good news is that uh, you can also send me a birthday gift on the, pres the day of the presidential election. I was born exactly uh, for the eight years, I'll be 48 years old on February 16, 2018, the date of the election. Yes. Okay. Sorry, 2019. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what, what's, the symbol, what's the symbol of uh, AAC? You know, people with hands. It's, it's, oh, two, it's two, hands. two hands. It's two hands. Yeah. Okay, because they don't put names for the candidates on the ballot. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. They, they uh, see, uh, it they is. Yes. That's, that's it. That's it, sir. That's, 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 that's it. Okay, that's 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 you see, the village people need to know. Yeah, that's how they know. They don't know anything. Wow. Um, one comment that I have is that um, I've, I've been following you. Your name first, if you can speak English. My name is uh, Engineer Olufemi Oladende. Okay, yeah. um, I've been, I, I'm a very, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the choir when you say preaching to the choir. Wow. So, um, one of the things that uh, bothered me was when I heard that uh, they would not allow you AAC. Uh, to use drones to monitor uh, the election um, sites. Because what a drone would have done is expose any type of uh, abnormalities going on right there. And I was like, well, why? What's the reason behind that? And how can we find other means of monitoring those uh, polling stations? So I don't uh, know if you've thought about no, that. Uh, okay. In the first place, <coughs> There's no law that says we can use drones, but they have made it a national security issue. Mm -hmm. and this is their own way of. In fact, I took a drone to Nigeria that is seized from me at the airport. It's still with them. Really? Yeah, just a civilian drone uh, that I used to monitor the Maroon campaigns. Mm -hmm. Because 
you know, we found that we have like one drone in Nigeria, and we find that when people see drones in the air, they are more careful. Yeah. Because you know, they know this will be. And we we got to the point where we got a drone that could live stream our activity. They seized it. It's still with them as we speak. But we will still put in as many drones as possible. It's just that we won't have the ability to purchase as many drones as we would have loved to. But there's a lot of drones these days that can go for hours nonstop and can cover at least 10 to 20 polling units and deliver results back to us, show who is bribing, so that we can have documentary evidence mm -hmm. at the end of the day that this election was free or not fair. But we will challenge that. We have already started talking to our lawyers to see if we can you know, get an injunction stopping them from stopping drones uh, on election day. Because election is the most important national security issue in Nigeria, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. A free and fair election absolutely. is the only way there can be peace. If mm -hmm. the elections are not free, they are not fair, the national security will be breached the next day. So we're making that argument. But if you have ability to support us with a drone or one or more, please do so. We will figure out how to get it in while we fight to ensure that it fly on that day. And I just bought one. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can go to put it to <laughs> Actually, I, I, I bought it for my own property yeah. because I was trying to see what's going on with my roof. Wow. And in Nigeria? In Nigeria, yeah. yes. I'm taking it home with me. Don't see that on camera. <laughs> they will see it. They will see it. They will be waiting for me, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah. where you have to go hire somebody to get an Akaba to get on that yeah, high yeah, yeah. No, no. I don't want to do that. I'll fly a drone to the roof yeah, yeah. and be able to monitor it. Yeah. The average drone cost about $30 to $50. Here in USA, yeah. So a good um, one, a good one. About yeah. Seven yeah. Seven seven oh yeah, yeah. those ones that can. With, with the yeah. one that I have can go four kilometers. You can uh, you can set it up to follow your car until the battery runs out. Yeah. And they get it better every day. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things we said is that even the headsman farmers conflict, they can be solved with drones. Mm -hmm. They can have a mm -hmm. drone following every major headsman that have mm -hmm. four their cows. So they yes. And they won't be able to see them because there are drones that can fly at 10,000 feet mm -hmm. uh, above sea level. Mm -hmm. And they can walk the whole day with their battery fully charged. And the moment you send them out, they can return home when their battery is about to die. Even when you are not there, they will, they will come back to the same place you sent them out. Yeah. It's simple technology. You yeah. cannot believe that Nigerian army of police. I took a drone to a lorry. The police was asking us, "Can we get your drone, please?" Uh, we say, "You never. You don't have a drone." It's ah, ah drone. We are asking. You. <laughs> we are talking about. We are still talking about petrol. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was uh, last comment. I saw a video of someone. Was that AAC that videoed what was going on in Kano? It was a drone. You could tell yeah. because that thing was hovering above heads getting close shots yeah. where they were counting like and then they run back right yeah. one ten one thousand one million they were counting people yeah. i mean they were at one million before the guy walked a distance of about 20 feet yeah. Yeah. he was already counting in one the same people they will go and right. run back and <laughs> yeah. one million votes. yes well yeah. for it was the it primaries was of his apc for yes. buhari yes. they were rigging it openly yeah. so they had yes. about a thousand people there yeah. so they would count That's one two right. three and they count Amazing. a thousand and a thousand people will run back and they'll start counting again. The same thousand people counted yeah. over ten times. Whoa. But it was revealed by a drone, yeah. Okay, so with regards to the north, right? Two very quick answers. Our VP is actually not on the person we chose as he was working very seriously. Second thing is that in this election, there is no one knot anymore. Buhari has done a great job dividing the knot. <laughs> yes, against himself. So people in Taraba, Benue, Plateau, that used to be part of what you know as the conventional, they have seceded from the knot, at least against Buhari, because of what the way he handled the farmer uh, headsman conflict. So Taraba, part of Adamawa, Southern Kaduna, Benue, Plateau, Gombe, they are all upset with the system. So the advantage is open for us in those places. Again, you will start seeing us uh, when we return next week doing open campaigns, and you'll be surprised. You need to watch some of our videos how we are welcomed in the north. You you you'll be surprised, and we're going to do more. 
But whatever you can do to support us to make it happen faster, uh, continue to do it. Thank you so much and once again. Let's thank Mr. Generosity, Eggs and sausage and bacon. Thanks. And talking about eggs and sausage and bacon, I'm sure your commitment. Okay. Please show your commitment to the candidates, and you know, if you want to start digging into your pockets and making a commitment. Please, please, we invite you to come tonight as well. Invite you. Bring, 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 bring friends. Thank you. 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 Thank you.